places to make sure that the spelling was correct, and it was, so I'm not 100% sure uh, how to pronounce that, but that was her name. They lived in Deer Park, Texas, with their two children. They had a daughter and a son. Their daughter's name was Elizabeth, and she was born in 1969, so she was only five years old at the time of the crime. Their son's name was Timothy. He was born on April, in April of 1966. He was a little bit older. And Timothy died on Halloween night, 1974. A little bit more background on Ronald. He was an optician at Texas State Optical, which was in Sharpstown, the Houston area, if any of you are familiar. He was also the deacon at his church. His church was called the Second Baptist Church. He also was very involved in his church's choir and led the choir. He was also in charge of the local bus program, so he was very involved in the community. All, you know, normal things. He was well known. He was well liked. You know, didn't really have a problem. Just a, a family, church going, working man. Or so we thought. That's how he started out. So let's fast forward to Halloween night, 1974. It's time to take the kids out trick or treating. So Ronald took his two kids in a very quiet neighborhood in the area of Pasadena, Texas, and he went with a neighbor who brought his children. So they went as like a little, a little tiny group. From what I read, the wife did not attend trick or treating. I'm not sure why. It wasn't really detailed, but it was Ronald taking his children trick or treating with the neighbor. So. They get to a house. The kids knock on the door and no one answers. The lights aren't on. It's very quiet. No one answers. So the kids, being young kids, they get frustrated and they get impatient and they just want candy. So they run ahead to another house because they just want their candy. Ronald stays back a little bit. The neighbor follows along with the kids to the next house. It's unclear as to how long Ronald stayed behind, but it was for a number of minutes. He eventually catches up with the kids, the neighbor and the neighbor's kids, and he produces five, how many inches were they? They were 21 inches, so almost two feet long pixie sticks. If you don't know what a pixie stick is, it's basically like a long tube or like a long plastic straw filled with powdered sugar. It's literally just pure, pure sugar. I never liked them as a kid, but kids love them. Um, so yeah, so he produces these five pixie sticks. Doesn't really say where he got them from, but he later confessed, as we will get into, or not confessed, he later claimed that he went back to that house that didn't answer the kids, and the person that lived there gave him the pixie sticks. That would be his story. So, of course, he's going to give it to the kids, right? So, at the end of the night, he gave each of his neighbor's kids, there were two kids, a pixie stick each. He gave one to his son, one to his daughter, and he had a leftover one. The leftover one he gave to a boy in the neighborhood that he recognized from his church. The little boy went to his church, I believe. I have it written somewhere. We'll get to it, but I believe the little boy was around 10 years old from his church. And so he had given out these five random pixie sticks. Now, before bed, Timothy, being a little boy, asked for more of his Halloween candy. He wanted to eat more candy. And he ended up choosing the pixie stick. Pixie sticks. Um, he had some trouble getting it open. There were some staples on it. And he couldn't get it open, and he couldn't get the powder out of the, the tube or the straw. So, Ronald helps him. He helps him open it. He helps him loosen up the powder and gives it to Timothy. 
opportunity for him to consume the candy. After eating the candy, Timothy immediately doesn't like the taste of it. He says it's very bitter, which sugar shouldn't really be bitter, but you know, hello. So um, he complains to Ronald. Ronald gives him some Kool-Aid to wash the taste out of his mouth. Almost immediately, Timothy starts complaining of an upset stomach, runs to the bathroom, starts throwing up, he starts convulsing. The poor little boy is suffering, he's in pain, and uh, Ronald claimed that he was sitting in the bathroom with Timothy, holding him while he threw up and while he was shaking. the other 
other children had enough to kill three to four adults each in each straw. Imagine, I don't know if it was a coincidence that he gave his son the one with the least amount, probably not, as if that made it better, I don't know. But that's just to give you an idea how much poison was in there for these kids. Now, of course, Ronald is going to be questioned by police. It's his son. You know, they're going to ask, where did the pixie sticks come from, right? Originally, Ronald claimed that he didn't remember where they came from. Um, and, you know, he didn't, he said, he was like, oh, we went to so many houses. And, you know, I don't remember what house they came from. And the police immediately became suspicious because his neighbor and himself, they only brought the kids to like two streets in the neighborhood, like nice calm streets. It was raining. It was pouring actually. So they didn't want to be outside very long. So they only went up and down two streets. So the police are like, out of two streets only, you don't remember where the, these really long straws filled with sugar came from. Police also learned that on those two streets that they went to, no one was giving out pixie sticks. It was just those five pixie sticks. No other kids had them. No other houses were giving them out. So that also raised a red flag. Ronald, because it was his son that passed away, he took the police around and they went around the neighborhood three times before he eventually brought them to that house that didn't answer the door for the kids, right? And he goes, oh, like, it, it came from this house, right? Um, he said he knocked before returning to the group. He said the owner did not turn on the lights. He said the owner, like, wasn't even visible. He just cracked the door open and, like, handed him the sticks through the crack on the door. Whatever. So that, that was his story, right? Um, he claimed that it was a man, but again, he said, I only saw his arm, and he claimed it was a very hairy arm. Those are his words. So now police, they do their thing, and they find that the house belongs to a man named Courtney Melvin. Now, Courtney Melvin was an air traffic controller for an airport. The airport was called William P. Hobby Airport. Um, and he didn't get home from work on Halloween night until 11 p.m. So that's why the lights were off. That's why no one answered. I don't know if he lived alone, but he wasn't there. And it was confirmed by over or nearly 200 people that he was indeed at work that night. So he was immediately ruled out as a suspect. And again, police are getting suspicious. They know that things just aren't adding up. You know, pixie sticks aren't just going to appear out of nowhere for only these five children. So they look into Ronald. As they continue to investigate, they learn that Ronald was over $100,000 in debt, which back then, that's worth a little bit less in today's time. That's equal to around $520,000. So he was in over his head. He had a history of being unable to keep a job, etc., etc., in just the 10 years prior to 1974. So from 64 to 74, he held 21 different jobs. That's a lot. That's crazy. So he could not hold a job. Um, at the time of this crime, 1974, the job that he currently had as an optician, he was suspected of theft, and he was actually on the verge of being fired. So he was about to lose that job. His car was about to be repossessed. He had defaulted at several bank loans, and he had the family home foreclosed on. So he was struggling. He was struggling. So police keep digging, and the next thing they find out is Ronald actually took out life insurance policies on both of his children. So, um, he did this just in the months prior to Timothy's death. So 
So at first they were $10,000 each life insurance policy. So in today's time, that's like 51, close to $52,000 each. Then one month before Timothy's death, Ronald took out an additional $20,000 on both kids, despite objections from, you know, the people at the insurance agency. He took out an extra twenty grand on each kid. Now, in the days preceding Halloween night, he took out an additional twenty thousand dollars on each child. Um, and this whole time, by the way, if you're wondering about the wife, she wasn't really involved in this. She claimed that she had no idea about these life insurance policies, which could very well be the case. I. I I would believe that she doesn't, but who knows, right? Police then learned as they started to look into the actual agency that Ronald was going to, he learned that the morning after Timothy died, Ronald called asking about claiming the money that he took out um, in this insurance policy on his son. They also learned that he had visited a chemical supply store in Houston to buy cyanide shortly before Halloween. So they started to piece everything together and they figured out that he had laced the candies to get his money, to get rid of his kids, and then he poisoned the other children or attempted to poison the other children in order to cover up his crime. How sick is that? Oh. So, Ronald was arrested for Timothy's murder on November 5th, 1974. So, only five short days went by. He was indicted on one count of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. He entered a plea of not guilty for all five counts and throughout the whole trial up until the very end, he tried to maintain his innocence saying that he didn't do anything. Now during his trial, when witnesses are being called to the stand, etc, etc, a chemist that was vaguely familiar with Ronald testified that during the summer of 1973, he had asked the chemist about cyanide and how it worked and how much of it would cause death. Okay, so the summer of 1973, that is so sick to me because that means that he was planning this for over a year in the house with his children, looking at them, knowing that he was planning to take their lives. That is so sick to me. Um, his friends and family also remembered uh, Ronald taking an unusual interest in cyanide all of a sudden, talking about it. Um, which is random. I don't, I don't know. I mean, what were they going to do, right? But I'm sure that must have been weird, right? Like, if a family member starts talking to me about poison, I'm going to be like, why are you talking to me about poison? Like, what do you need that for? This one also blew, blows me away, and I don't know if this is true or not. I have no way of knowing, but his brother-in-law and his sister-in-law recalled him talking about using the money from the life insurance policies um, and like talking about taking a long vacation or you know buying other items and, or whatever <laughs> I don't know I hope that one's not true but whatever so like I said he always tried to maintain his innocence the press once they got a hold of this they started to nickname him the candy man and that's where that nickname came from so on June 3rd, 1975, a jury took only 46 minutes to find O'Brien guilty of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. It then took them 71 minutes to sentence him to death. Shortly after this conviction, his wife filed for divorce and left him. Uh, she later remarried and her new husband formally adopted Elizabeth, their daughter, which is nice. Um, I don't know why she waited until after 
sure he was convicted. I don't know. Well, whatever. Let me not even go there. So, Ronald was confined to Huntsville Unit in Huntsville, Texas. He was completely shunned and despised by his fellow inmates. He had no friends. They literally hated him. Because, you know, again, word gets out. They knew what he had done to his son. His execution date was postponed twice, so whoever was fighting for him, because they were fighting to, I guess, get him appealed and whatever, it was postponed twice. The third time the judge gave a date, he said that he would personally drive Ronald to the death chain chamber himself, which, that's crazy for a judge, like, he did not want to approve you know, postponing the date. It was postponed one other time, and that was, that was the last time. Um, and so on March 31st, 1984, Ronald was executed by lethal injection. Again, maintaining his innocence to the end, and I have a little quote here that he made as like his final statements. Uh, where he starts, you know, he states that the death penalty is wrong, blah, blah, blah. He says, quote, I forgive all, and I do mean all, those who have been involved in my death. God bless you all, and may God's best blessings be always yours. The day of the execution, as it was going on, there was a crowd of like 300 plus people outside the prison, and they were like yelling, trick or treat. And then there were a group of protesters who were protesting, not really him, but just like the death penalty in general, and people threw candy at them. So it was a great scene outside of the death chamber. So um, Ronald is currently buried in Forest Park East Cemetery in Webster, Texas. And poor little Timothy is buried in Forest Park Lawndale Cemetery in Houston, Texas. And that is the story of Ronald O'Brien. Um, I, I feel like I have heard, I don't know if it was Ronald specifically, but I remember when I was younger, there was talk of, um, like parents, like when I used to go trick-or-treating, I would hear like my friend's parents talk about pixie sticks specifically and how pixie sticks made them um, nervous and I don't know if it's because of this story but it, it does sound familiar and there was also talk I remember of um, people, I don't know if it actually happened or if people were just afraid of it but talking about uh, like putting razor blades in certain candy or whatever and I just I remember that that was a, a big topic of conversation when I was younger because um, it is true you know you're getting things that you're consuming from strangers and you, you know you you don't know so those of you that have young children check your kids Halloween candy if you are going trick-or-treating which I hope none of you are that young and watching this video but if you are and you're going trick-or-treating please be careful. Inspect your candy. Don't go anywhere by yourself. Please, please be smart this year. I know Halloween's kind of like canceled this year, but you know, I'm sure there are still people that are going to go out. So just please be careful, but have fun and have a safe Halloween. I hope that you guys enjoyed this case. I know that it was a little bit on the shorter side, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video nonetheless. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you.